So with that being said, we're going to dive into the Word. In fact, we've been using this passage in Galatians. Here it is on the screen for you as our guide this, this, this series. Here's what Paul says. He says, You, my brothers and sisters at Forest Lake Seventh Avenue Church, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, this morning I'm celebrating what you're doing at Forest Lake Church. It's powerful to watch your spirit move in the hearts and lives of, of people in, in this congregation, and I ask that you'll just continue to push us, to, to urge us, to challenge us, to move us this morning to be more and more focused on serving others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Over the last week, starting probably even the week before, all of us have been looking at one thing. We've been looking at the spaghetti patterns on the radar. Have you been looking at those? All of us did. Now, some of you are Weather Channel people, and like you just love to watch Jim Cantore, and wherever he is, you don't want to be. Others of you are uh, radar nerds. You know who you are. You have multiple premium paid apps on your phone that you are willing to pay big bucks so that you can look at different filters and different colors. You probably have an Excel spreadsheet where you're tracking lightning strikes and barometric pressure. You basically have your PhD in weather forecast, but we've all been looking at one thing, where Hurricane Ian is heading. You watched it out in the Caribbean, you watched it come up through Cuba, coming into the Gulf, and then you got real serious about it, and you started tracking, where is it going? Where is it going? Everybody wanted to know where it was going. You know, there's a basic life principle that everybody knows. It's looking where things are going, looking where you're going. When you learn to ride a bike, you are taught to look where you're going. Uh, when you drive a car, you're, you learn the principle, look where you're headed. Uh, when, when you are driving forward, you look out the windshield. When you're backing up, you look out the rear window. If you have a Tesla, you probably aren't doing anything as the car is driving itself, right? <laughs> you just look where you're going. But how many times have you been driving and you get distracted with something? Maybe your phone vibrates. Maybe uh, you're changing the station on whatever, Spotify. Uh, maybe you just look out and you see something weird happening and you get so distracted that you almost have a car accident. You've been there before. I have too. When I was in college, um, Jen and I, we decided to go to Colorado with her cousin and her boyfriend, who was one of my best friends. That's Jen's cousin's boyfriend, just to clarify. Uh, and we, we went to Colorado to go do some snowboarding. I borrowed my parents' van, and we headed across the country. Um, Jen's cousin's dad, so Jen's uncle, has a condo at Winter Park Resort there in Colorado, and he was going to let us use that. And so we get to Denver, and we stopped at his mother's house where he had stashed a Toyota Land Cruiser 4x4, and he said, just use that to get up to the mountains. So we stopped, and we got in his car, drove up to the mountains, enjoyed a week of snowboarding and snow skiing, and after we were fully exhausted, we were ready to head home. And now, I was the first shift driver to drive the, this person that I had only met once before, his vehicle. And so I drive slowly down from Winter Park down to the interstate. There was ice and snow on the road, so I was careful getting there. But when I got to the interstate, I thought, you know what? It's going to be clear sailing. They'll have the interstate cleared. And I get to the on-ramp, and it's perfectly clear. And so I jump on the accelerator, and we're getting up to speed. And I get up onto the freeway and it's covered in snow and traffic. Everyone's moving very slow, and I'm moving faster than everyone else. Now, you have to understand that the car in front of me, one of its brake lights was not working. And you may or may not be like this, but I was fixated on the brake light that wasn't working. And as I come up into the snow, it gets a little squirrely, and I'm looking at the car in front of me, and I'm just looking at that brake light that isn't working, and it takes me forever to realize that he's braking in front of me. And at the very last second, I realize what's happening, and so I swerve the wheel, and the, the vehicle spins out sideways, and so I steer into the, the, the spin, and we move the other way into the next lane, and now we're going the opposite, so I turn into the spin. We, we move the other way until the back of this uh, someone else's Toyota Land Cruiser taps the guardrail, it straightens us out, and we are safe. No damage for you that are thinking that. We're good. How often do we get distracted by something that doesn't matter and lose our focus on what really does matter? 
I mean, when we focus on what's n not the most important, what's most important becomes not important. And in Galatians chapter 5, as Paul is preaching, as he, he's writing this letter to, to this church, he's talking to two groups. He's talking to the group of, of Jewish converts that come with all their tradition and baggage, and he's talking to Gentile converts that are brand new to Christianity, and in very blunt words, he's saying, all you need is Jesus. His grace is enough. You don't need to add to it. You can't add to it. In fact, if you add to it, you make it worthless. He says, it's enough. Just leave it at that. Don't add your works or your circumcision. Jesus' grace is everything. Paul says, focus on what is the most important, and that's Jesus. But then he goes on, and I believe he points that church and our church to something different, to not be distracted, but to be focused on what is the most important. Let's read it again. It's on the screen for you. Here's what it says. You, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. He says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Are you hearing Paul speak to the church this morning? He's saying ever so bluntly that while you were called to be free, if all you ever do with the freedom that you found in Jesus is take it for granted, then you completely missed what's most important. And he says, if, if all you ever do with your freedom in Jesus is use it as an excuse to do whatever you want, then you completely miss the most important thing. He says, if you use freedom in Jesus as a badge that you carry around like you achieved something, then you miss the most important thing. Paul says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve. This part's beautiful to me because it's what the life of a disciple looks like. When they have experienced the gospel, the good news, and it's changed their life, they don't hang on to it, they don't hold on to it, they give it to somebody else to impact their life. That's what disciples do. They take what's been given to them and they give it to somebody else. And I believe that serving others is probably the greatest form of evangelism on the planet. You know, I'm reading a book now. Here's the picture of the book. It's a, it's a great book so far. You'll see it in a second here on the screen. It's called The Conspiracy of Kindness by Steve Sogren. Pretty sure I said that right. Maybe, the, I don't know. There he is. He's a, a pastor, a church leader. Uh, I heard about this book years and years ago, and finally I'm getting to read it, and it's fantastic. He writes from a lot of church and leadership experience, and he shares a different view on what evangelism and sharing the gospel looks like. See, forever, in pretty much all Protestant denominations, that's, that's Methodist, Baptist, Adventist, it's, it's the whole crew, Protestants protesting against uh, Catholic Church way back when, Pretty much all of us have for, uh, forever thought that evangelism looks like crusades and big-time reaping series where we come in and we preach 28 fundamentals and then we dunk people at the end like a graduation, and that must be discipleship. And yet Steve, he changes the script a little bit. He shares a different picture of what evangelism looks like, and he calls it servant evangelism. Here's what he does in his church, and I think it's pretty powerful regularly his church has scheduled days where they just focus on serving others. When it's raining outside, they go to grocery stores with umbrellas and they help people get from the store to their cars when it's pouring rain because they love them. At Christmas time, they go to the mall and they set up tables in the food court and they have free gift wrapping uh, just loving on people. And one time they were at the mall and they were doing this gift wrap thing and the mall said, no, 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 we don't want you here. And so they said, cool, no worries. So they went into the stores and talked to the managers and they said, hey, we would love, we would love if you would let us just clean your bathrooms. And the managers' jaws dropped. They said, you want to do what? They've gone into parking lots and washed people's windshields and left a little card that says, just showing Jesus' love in practical ways. On hot summer days, they go where the people are, and they have drinks and water, and they give it away. They're changing what evangelism looks like, and it starts with serving others. Now, don't get me wrong. I feel like if all you ever do is just community service, then I don't think you get the whole picture of what helping someone be discipled in Jesus is. But when it starts with serving somebody else, it changes everything. It means so much more. The message is so much clearer because it comes with love. See, I believe that serving others is the universal love language. Everyone understands it. 
Everything becomes clearer. It's more meaningful and it lasts longer. When I was pastoring, first year pastoring in Georgia Cumberland Conference, uh, the, the, the president of the conference was Ed Wright, his son David Wright. Here's a picture of David. We'll put it on the screen for you. There he is, good looking dude. His wife Elizabeth, that's uh, Ted Wilson's daughter actually. Um, they were pastoring up in a little church up in North Georgia mountains. Just a, just a real small church that was dying in fact. Uh, the members were very old and they continued to get older and no new members were coming in. And so he gets placed in this church and he's ready to do something different because he realizes is that this church is going to die unless something else happens. And so he, like me, like Steve, believes that service and serving others is the greatest form of initiating evangelism. And so he did something unbelievable. There was one gas station in town. And so he said, all right, team, here's what we're going to do. Gas prices were at an all-time high. He said, on one day, one Sunday, one afternoon for two hours, we're going to buy down the gas price at this gas station by 50 cents a gallon. They went and talked to the manager of the gas station. He said, let's do it. I love this plan. So on that Sunday afternoon, the cars began to line up. They lined all the way up through downtown, wrapped around the corner. And as cars would come in, one of the church members would come up and say, hey, so glad that you're here to get some gas. Which kind of gas would you like? And they would tell them, they'd start pumping the gas. Some another church member would come over and say, hey, well, we've got snacks and we got drinks. Which would you like? Here's the spread. And then, they'd get, and then somebody else would come out and they'd wash the windshield. And they would say, hey, we're just doing this because we want to show Jesus love in practical ways because we're called to serve others. It changed the town because the town realized that that church wasn't there to, for, to serve themselves. They were there to serve the community. They understood through gas what the gospel looked like. And in a very real way, I see a picture of what Paul talks about in Galatians. He says, don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Instead, serve somebody else. He says, keep the most important thing, the most important thing. Don't get distracted, stay focused, look where you're headed, living the gospel, being a missional, others-focused church, and stay focused on it. You know, because I believe what Paul says is true about, about serving others, every church that I get to, be a, 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 to get to serve with, it's my heart that the church becomes more and more mission-minded and, and serves others. In fact, uh, one, one church a few years ago, um, it was in Buford, Georgia. It's a suburb of Atlanta, just northeast of Atlanta. A great little church. Here's a picture of the, the church building. It's a, it's a, we rented this space. It was just a, a, it was a warehouse, essentially, in a, an industrial park. And we, uh, it was awesome. Right down the street from this church was a trailer park filled with uh, many people that have much lower incomes than probably most of you. People that have chronic illnesses, people that are on disability, people that are just your average Joe that gets up and goes to work every day and comes home. And I thought, this is a perfect opportunity for our church to do something amazing. There's people, there's hundreds of people here that we can serve. And so we went into this trailer park and I, and I said, guys, I'm gonna bring a mission trip to you. A lot of people don't have time to go on a mission trip or money or whatever it is. I said, I'm going to bring a mission trip to you. And so one week in the summer, and we did this every year, we called it local mission outreach. And, and uh, I, so I said, all right, guys, let's gather around. So we'd go to t several different homes, and we would just simply serve. We would sand down porches and paint them. We would pressure wash homes and driveways. We changed people's oil in their cars. We did, we sh cut their shrubs and mowed their yards. I mean, this one lady, uh, as I knocked on her door to kind of get ideas of what we were gonna be doing, I said, hey, what can we do at your house? Well, how can we help you? And she said, well, I have a broken bed. And so we said, we can fix it. We got guys that can do this. That first year, as we were working on different things, the neighbor house to one of the houses, the homes we were working on, uh, had a giant blue tarp over their, their, their trailer. And, we, and I walked over and knocked on the door and I said, hey, tell me about what's going on. And, and he let me in his house and there was spots all over the ceiling where water had dripped straight through the ceiling. And there was holes in the roof. And so we had this tarp over the top. And so I said, well, let me get back with you. And one of the Romanian church members that was just close to our church was a, a, a um, roofing guy. And I said, hey, Chris, hey, man, what can you do for us? And he said, I got you. So we pulled the whole roof off and put a brand new roof on for free. Why? Because we wanted to show Jesus love in practical ways. 
We followed it up. We said, we got to do more in this community. We got to do more to show Jesus love because that's what we're called to do. We're called to be free so that we can serve others. And so we, we said, you know, what does what this, this home, this trailer park need? And we said, we want to bring health to this group. So we said, all right, we're going to have a total health expo, everything you can imagine. And on one Sabbath day, we, we rented out the community center right there in the middle of this trailer park, and hundreds of people showed up. We had doctors and nurses that were doing mild exams, and you can, can consult with them. We had eye doctors that were checking out people's eyes. We had dentists and dental hygienists. Jen was one of the hygienists that would, that would look in somebody's mouth, which is just so gross to me. I don't know how you could have this as a career. Thank you, Jen. And look in there and, and say, well, you probably have a cavity here, so you need to go see a dentist. Here's, here's one you could go to. We had uh, healthy food that they could sample. We worked with the barbers and stylists that were just down the road, and we said, would you come and cut hair? And they said, sure, and they did it for free. And after a whole afternoon of this, the community knew that our church existed for them, not we were waiting for them to come to us. And it was the very first steps of building disciples, friendships with them that turned into Bible studies, that turned into disciple making, that turned into church members so they could go and do the same thing. Paul's not the only one, though, that speaks about serving others as the core of what a disciple exists for. In the Old Testament book, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 61, we get a messianic chapter that points forward to Christ, looking forward to when Jesus comes. And he records this, and I think he's talking about Christ, but also what a church looks like that's dedicated to Christ. Here it is on the screen for you. For you. Isaiah chapter 61, it says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news. That's the gospel to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. He says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That describes the church that gives beauty instead of ashes, joy instead of mourning, that comforts the distraught, that points people to something better. That's the picture of a church in action. It's the picture of the church that's on a move. It's a picture of a church that keeps the main thing the main thing. It's a picture of an outward-focused church that exists for others, to live the gospel and be on God's mission, to open doors to the depth of who God really is. You know, one of my favorite authors, her name's Ellen White, she writes in the book Ministry of Healing. Here's what she says. I bet you've heard this one before. She says this. She says, there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. That's not corporate collective effort. That's one-on-one. That's building relationships. She says, if less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted. She goes on, she says, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. We need less sermons up front and more sermons in the form of serving serving others. I mean, think about the impact that we can make. That's why one of our core values here at Forest Lake is service. That's why several times a year we shut the doors to the sanctuary so that their service doesn't happen here, it happens out there. I mean, October 29 is coming up. If you haven't signed up for it, as you leave today, there's tables there ready for you to sign up so you can be a part of that day. It's what we do is serve others. It's how we keep the main thing the main thing. This whole freedom campaign that I keep talking about, it may feel like it revolves around money, but I don't believe it. I believe it revolves more around mission. I believe it revolves around helping us keep the main thing the main thing. Listen, every month, our church spends about $40,000 just to pay off 
debt. That's a lot of money every single month just to pay off debt, and it's become a distraction. Any way, shape, or form you cut it, it, it looks like a distraction, but it has to end. We cannot let that win. And just think about what we could do if we had an extra $40,000 a month. There's a church in Kennesaw, Georgia. That's where I used to live. It's just the town north of Marietta. It's a, cha- it's a, it's a church called North, uh, north Star. It's a non-denominational church that's growing like wildfire. I know the pastor. I've talked to him several times. I know some members that go to that church that I met at the YMCA up there. Um, he, his church was in an incredibly similar situation to ours. They built buildings and had around $6 million of debt and about 40000 a month that they were paying. And his church went on a capital campaign just like what we're doing here. But here's what's cool. At the end of three years, there were so many new members and so much more income that they didn't stop the $40,000 a month even after they had paid all their debt. They took the $40,000 every month and they gave it away. They said, we want to be on God's mission, so what do we do? How can we help people? How can we give money away? How can we serve our community? What can we use this money for? And as I think about their church, it makes me think about our church. What can we do with an extra $40,000 every month? Did you know that the average Habitat for Humanity house costs about $90,000? That means that every three months, we could give a home away to someone. Isn't that amazing? What if, we, what if we got together with community leaders and maybe hospital leaders and maybe other church leaders in our area and we said, hey, there's a problem with homelessness here. What can we do to solve that? Oh, by the way, our church wants to back that to the tune of $40,000 a month. I mean, what, what could we do? You just think about it. What if we took $40,000 and we went to Duke Energy? Now, I realize that some of you are not happy with Duke Energy right now. And what if we said, hey, Duke, here's what we want to do. We want you to look at your records and all of those people that they're about to have their electricity turned off, we want to pay their remaining debt so that they can understand what freedom looks like. Here's our $40,000. What if we took 40 grand and we said, we're going to fund students to go to Fleece and FLA so that they can experience Christian education? I mean, just think about what we could do. Serving others. It's at the heart of the freedom campaign. And I believe that we together, as we give sacrificially over the next three years, that we're going to see something amazing happen in our church and in our community. But it's going to take all of us to do it, guys. Uh, It's everybody. It's not just a few that make a ton of money. It's everybody together, no matter how old you are or how young you are. Listen, this last week, I was in the pool with my boys swimming around. Sounds like I spend all my time swimming, doesn't it? We were swimming, having a good time, and it was about bedtime. And so I said, all right, fellas, let's get out of the pool and let's go get ready for bed. And one of my boys, I won't tell you names, one got out and went to start getting ready. The other one chose to not get out right then. And so I had to spend a little extra time encouraging, come on, let's get out of the pool. It's time to go get ready for bed. And as I'm kind of shouting so the neighbors know that I'm a good father, uh, (laughs) my other son comes back and uh, he's holding something. He says, hey, dad. I say, what? What do you want? (laughs) And he said, Dad, um, I I want to give this to the Freedom Campaign. It's a $20 bill. Do you know how much a $20 bill is to a young guy? A $20 bill to a young guy is like half a month's salary to most of you. (laughs) He says, I want to give this to the Freedom Campaign. I said, dude, we haven't even talked about what our family is going to give, but he wants to do it. He's a young dude. And if it'll help you understand where you are at, let's do some math. I've done some math. I'm not a good math guy, so if these numbers come, come out real strange, you can help me later on. Our church has just over 4,000 members. Let's cut that in half because we'll say families, okay? 4,000 divided by two, we'll just call it family giving units. Let's say that we'll cut that in half as well because there's probably a lot of people that uh, don't live around here anymore, some that have died and we just never took them off the books, some that uh, maybe they go to another church or maybe they're not even Adventist anymore, but they don't attend here. It's not, they're not a part of Forest Lake actively. So let's say we have about 1,000 families, giving units, whatever you want to call it. If you take $6 million and you divide it by 1,000, you get... Ah, good. You're not good at math either. <laughs> Alicia, you can help us out. If you take $6 million and you divide it by 1000 you get $6,000. Now, to me, that sounds like a chunk of change. I don't know about y'all, but uh, it sounds like a lot of money. 
Maybe it's not a lot of money to you. That's okay. Let me make it, let me make it better for you. If you take $6,000 and you divide it by three years, you get $2,000. See, you're, you're getting it. Thank you, Izzy. $2,000. Still sounds like a lot of money to me. If you take $2,000 and you divide it up by 12 months of the year, you get about $166. And if you divide that by the months of the year, or the, the days of the month, you get about five and a half dollars a day. Now, let's get a little more manageable so you can understand this in real life. Um, five dollars a day. What is five dollars a day? Yeah, everybody says Starbucks, and it is true, right? Your latte. So if you skipped your latte for three years, there's going to be a lot of grumpy people. I'm not saying get rid of your caffeine. I'm just saying maybe you think of other ways that you get your caffeine. I don't know. Uh, maybe you make it at home. Five dollars. Here's one, and I'm going to step on some toes this morning. Ladies, and this is dangerous territory. Five dollars a day is what we're looking for here, times seven days a week is about 35 bucks. If, ladies, if you skipped one trip to Target a week, (laughs) someone gasped, you'd have your 35 dollars. Okay, if you still go to Target, maybe you just skip going to the, the dollar spot on the way in. That's five or six dollars every time, am I right? Fellas, I'm with you too. What if we skipped a trip to Home Depot or Best Buy once a week? The women say, yeah, yeah, okay. How about this one? I know everybody, this one. What if you just didn't go to TJ Flats on Friday after school? I know y'all are there because I've seen you there. 35 bucks a week, you'd get that pretty quickly. I got another one. This, this is even better. Some of you may hate me for this one. What if, instead of uh, not spending money so that you could save money, we did it a little differently that you didn't even notice? Hopefully. What if you just turned your air conditioning up one degree warmer? Would you notice it? Yes, we would, Pastor Matt. Bad idea. Okay, okay. I'm just thinking out loud here. Whatever makes sense for you and your budget, Let it make sense because your small commitment turns into a massive commitment for the Freedom Campaign. And let's be honest, there's a lot of families here that will make a much larger commitment than $6,000. And there are some here today that $6,000 would kill you in three years. But together, no matter your amount, I know that together we can do this. In fact, um, at this moment, I think we've got some deacons around. Do we have some deacons here? Oh, where are my deacons? Bill Alvarez and the deacons, are you close by? Oh, this could be trouble. Where's my deacons? Les McCoy, you're in the back there. Oh, here they come. Here they come. All right, here's what I'd like you to do. If I need one representative from each family. It could be the head of household, maybe the dad, maybe the mom. It could just be a kid. I don't care. One representative from each family just to stand. Would you do that for me? Just stand. It's not awkward. We're all doing it together. Thank you. Yes. All right. The deacons are coming right now. They're going to pass you a card. Yep. They're passing you a card. And once you get the card, you can sit down. That way they, they know you're there. They're, gonna, they're in the balcony too. This is good. Now, while you are standing here, I want to talk to the online crew. Those of you that are online, I didn't forget about you. I'm so glad that you're a part of our church family and that you're uh, connecting with us today in this way. For you, you can't get the physical card that's getting passed out, but I have something for you. If you go to our website, forestlake.church forward slash freedom, you get all the information that, is, that we're passing out right now. You got a little video from me. You've got the breakdown of what it is. And then you get this little worksheet that everyone else is getting right now. They're passing them out. It's a card that looks like this, if you haven't gotten it yet. It says freedom on it, and it says head of household. And I'll explain it to you. In fact, I'll just, I'll just launch into that now, and you can look at it. On the back, on the back, there's some, some, a couple of paragraphs that talk about sacrifice and then there's a worksheet. How many of you like worksheets? No one likes worksheets? In the back we have one worksheet lover. That's good. Here's what it looks like. I'll walk through real quickly. It's a worksheet for you and your family to go through. Maybe it's uh, you and your kids. Maybe it's you and your spouse. Whatever it looks like, be together. You got four lines. The first one is your total monthly income. Hopefully you know what that is. The line underneath that is tithe. 
Remember, all this belongs to God. He just asked for 10% back. Below that is offering, and I'm going to pause there for a minute. Are you with me this morning? If you're with me, say amen. amen. This offering line is very critical to our church. We can't take offering church budget money and put it towards freedom campaign. Otherwise, we pay off debt and our church dies because we have no monthly income. The last one is freedom campaign over three years. So this week, I encourage you as a family to go through this card or online. You can go through the, the, the same thing online and figure out what you believe is feasible for your family to give towards freedom campaign. We can do it together, guys, but it's going to take all of us. Kids, you can be involved too. Next Sabbath is Commitment Sabbath, when we as a church take a giant step of faith forward. And as we keep the main thing the main thing, I believe God's going to do something powerful in this church and in our community. And we can look back over these next three years and say, man, God did something powerful through the Forest Lake Church. May God bless us as we move forward in faith with him.